Hello, this is Professor Reardon for University of Calgary CPSC 526, Lecture 14 on Intrusion Detection, or Detecting Attacks. We spent a lot of time talking about all the different attacks that can exist, um, and we've come up with some ways of preventing the attacks, but we haven't spent much time talking about how to notice in the first place that it, there is an attack or that an attack did occur. Because prevention eventually fails. There will be attacks. Your systems will be eventually compromised despite your best efforts at preventing. So what we need is an ability to detect such compromise, possibly respond to such compromise, and as well an attempt to contain the damage that such a compromise would do. The idea here is that we expect that uh, attacks will actually happen, and when we detect it, we can try to stop it, we can try to clean up the mess, we can try to mitigate any damage, we can try to reverse things back to how they were. So even if we think that our system is solid, it's still prudent to have intrusion detection mechanisms, ways to detect attacks, mechanisms for that just in case, and this is an example of defense in depth. We want to have lots of different defenses available um, and different types of defenses available for us. So as an example, suppose you're running a web server and it processes requests like this. It's running at foo.com and there's a get data path where you can pass in profile equals info slash user dot text or something. And what this does as a web server is it then processes the HTTP arguments to get this profile equals info slash user dot text and presumably opens that file on the actual computer and serves the response. So what if the user the client, the person who made the request, had actually sent something like profile equals dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash etsy slash password, right? Now, if get data is a program that simply takes the argument and opens that file and somehow gives the file back in some way to the, the person who made the HTTP request, this would have the effect of opening the password file, the slash etsy slash password, and returning that. And this is, of course, would be monumentally bad because the password file should not be leaked. Even if you are securing your passwords with best practices, you still don't want a random HTTP request to be able to obtain that password information. Now, you can fix the get data script. This is obviously a problem in the get data script. It shouldn't be uh, opening these files. It should be sandboxed in such a way that it can't open these files. But still, it would be nice to have alternative mechanisms, detection mechanisms, more than one defense than hopefully not having a bug in your code. Because again, we'll eventually have bugs in codes, and we want to have secondary mechanisms to help protect, even if that is the case. So there's two types of intrusion detection systems, network and host. So we'll start first with network intrusion detection systems. And the idea here is that they look at all network traffic and for instance, if they were trying to detect this specific attack that we just gave as an example, they would look for things like slash Etsy slash password, or they'd look for dot dot slash, and they would try to shut down those connections that included that. You can imagine they would have to list all the different files that should be protected like this, all the different files that might correspond to an attack happening, or any signature of an attack that could be occurring would be on the list of things that the network intrusion detection system would be looking for. And when it sees an example of something that shouldn't be happening, then it can shut down the connection. It can say, no, this connection is not good. So one advantage of a network intrusion detection system is that it doesn't actually touch the end systems. It doesn't actually touch the computer that's running this web server. And there's many times where servers are just required to run some legacy code that's been written a long time ago and somehow works and no one ever touches the code and it just has to run for some critical purpose. 
And it's not awkward and hard to actually change the machine that's running that code. So in this case, the network intrusion detection system has the benefit that you really can bolt on security. You're just adding it in after the fact. And it's cheap to do. You have a firewall that's already looking at the packets, and this would just be in the same sort of pipeline. You can imagine first the firewall processes, the packet headers, and then if it passes, it goes to the network intrusion detection system, which processes the payload and decides whether or not to kill the connection. Alternatively, it could in parallel be sent to the network intrusion detection system that can make a decision not in real time, but uh, after it has processed it and end a connection uh, after the fact, and hopefully with enough that it reduces the latency for legitimate requests, but is prompt enough to stop illegitimate requests. This also has the benefit <clears throat> of central control over all your services. Again, you have one system running the network intrusion detection system, you have one configuration file to update, and it does its job in one single place. Now, what are some disadvantages? Well, we can look for slash etsy slash password, but of course we, we do have to come up with all possible things to look for. So not just slash etsy slash password, but slash etsy slash dot slash password or dot dot slash etsy again. All the different ways that this could be represented, all the different files that correspond to the same resource in the end. We have to scan for um, this dot dot slash to try to escape the directory that we're in. But what if this is actually a legitimate request? What if for some reason our HTTP server uses dot dot slash in some way that is meaningful and it is not actually representing a file system path? It's it's not unreasonable to say that it might be used this this character string might be used for some other purpose, in a legitimate purpose, and now a network intrusion detection that simply blindly considers the string dot dot slash to be an attack traffic would trigger false positives. As well, there's many ways that it can appear without explicitly meaning dot dot slash. For instance, percent to e percent to e percent to f would be an HTTP hex encoded string that represents the same information dot dot slash, to e being hex for dot and to f being hex for slash. And this is a sort of example of a evasion or uh, obfuscation, right? So now the network intrusion detection would have to see all possible ways that the ultimate server would interpret a string into dot dot slash, not just the string dot dot slash. And finally, what if it's in secured traffic? What if it's in encrypted traffic, HTTPS and not HTTP? Well, now you have a network intrusion detection that needs to be actually doing a man-in-the-middle attack. It needs to access decrypted traffic. It needs to know the session key. It's no longer end-to-end -end secure, and this opens up a huge number of further problems that you don't want to have to be dealing with. So an alternative is host-based intrusion detection system. And here, the idea is that you instrument the web server itself. So now the web server is converting all of its input into some arguments after it does any deobfuscation, after it de in decrypts the traffic over HTTPS, and it has the actual values that it turns it into. So the obfuscations don't matter anymore. It knows exactly what it's about to pass as a string into the program. So now it can scan all of these arguments on the host side and check to make sure that they're good arguments. Right. So now before running some legacy program that's actually going to run on these strings, this server could check the host-based intrusion detection system, checks all the strings, make sure they're safe, and then proceeds. So as a pro, you don't have to worry about obfuscations or different encodings, like %2e for the dot symbol, and it works with TLS secured traffic without having to do complex and insecure stuff like actively man in the middling all of the network traffic in your organization. On the con side, however, you have to now add code to every web server. You have to make sure every host has running on it a host intrusion detection system. It's not a single piece of software that you bolt on security into your organization by adding a intrusion detection system in the flow of the network traffic. As well, it only now detects web server attacks, so if the attack would have happened because of packets at the operating system level or something before the web server actually processes it, it won't be able to detect, you won't be able to have rules for that. And you, as well, you still have to consider all the other files, so like dot dot 
slash dot dot slash etsy uh, slash password or password slash dot slash or slash etsy slash dot slash password all the different permutations that represent the same resource the third approach is to do logging so here you store log files for all of the web servers on a computer. So now all of the requests that are sent, all of the HTTP requests that get sent, you get all the arguments, you save them to a log, and then, for instance, every night, you look at them all. You have a program that runs, looks at all the log traffic, scans all the arguments, sees what you get, and um, this also has the benefit of giving evidence production. You actually recorded all these requests, you can see what they are, you have evidence after the fact. It's not that the computer runs it or doesn't run it. You actually recorded all of it, right? So it's cheap to do. Web servers are already doing logging. You just configure it to log these arguments, or you may already be doing that. And of course, it has no problems with the different encoding types. It has no problem with TLS secure traffic because it's happening at the host side. However, on the con side, you do have to consider the different files that might correspond to the same resource, the, the different ways of uh, the dot dot slash and so forth. And as well, logging cannot block attacks and prevent them, right? You're allowed to see that an attack occurred, but the detection is delayed. It's not that an intrusion detection system upon noticing attack stops the HTTP connection from going any further, prevents it from getting executed, prevents that IP address from sending other traffic. Instead, the next day, you see a whole bunch of attacks that occurred, which may not be already too late. As well, if, especially if the password file is exposed or something like that, they log into the system, they gain access to the system, and then maybe they even tamper with the logs, stop logging, delete the, the attack traffic, make it look like they were never there. Right. So it may be the case that if they've already gotten what they needed, if the attack occurs, the evidence production may not be reliably stored if they're also able to tamper with that. Another approach is to monitor system calls. So now instead of monitoring or in doing this intrusion detection system at the operating system or at the web server, you're doing it in the operating system. So for example, every time the file system opens the file slash etsy slash password, you make a note of it. The operating system records this information or maybe does an audit and decides whether or not this should happen. In principle, most programs on a computer shouldn't read this file. This file is rarely read by programs other than ones that are doing authentication of users. And so it is unlikely that a web server should even access this, right? And the principle of least privilege tells us that a web server shouldn't be allowed to access it because it doesn't have a need to access it. Right. One pro or pros of the monitoring system calls is that it effectively deals with uh, both HTTP, HTTPS traffic. It does all the file name, rename tricks if a symbolic link or different paths that represent the same resource, because ultimately the operating system knows it's trying to open this file, and this is the file that you're concerned about. This is the file that you're trying to protect. And as well, any alert here corresponds to successful attacks. So if the operating system were to open slash Etsy slash password on behalf of the web server, this means that this was an attack that the web server did not stop, that no other system in place prevented this attack, that this had this not stopped it, this would have actually been a successful attack. And on the con side, however, Looking at all of the file system accesses is a huge amount of data. There's a large number of these system calls. It could alert on legitimate accesses to files causing false positives. And as well, we may still want to detect attempts even if they would have otherwise failed, right? It could be useful to scan the arguments and record it, evidence production, even if the web program processing it wasn't going to actually crash or actually exhibit a vulnerability, actually open the, the password file, even if it weren't actually going to be a security event in this moment, it can be useful to still have the situational awareness that this IP is sending evil packets to this server, or that it is trying to break into these servers. Because as well, this IP may be sending bad packets to insecure servers as well, maybe doing other attacks elsewhere, and we may just want to block that IP from sending any traffic onto our network. So, in summary, the differences the, between uh, network intrusion detection systems and host-based intrusion detection systems, 
Uh, Network-based gives a l lot of systems get coverage with one deployment. You simply bolt on one piece, uh, one server in the pipeline of network traffic, and it is able to monitor all that traffic. It, there's no touching, changing, and systems, so if it's running on some antiquated computer running old software, you don't need to actually change anything about it. It doesn't use any, any production resources in order to uh, m perform its duties. That is, that the servers that are actually handling user requests are not actually slowed down by the existence of this extra machine that's doing the monitoring. The ones that are actually providing services to users can still continue to operate at 100% efficiency, and it's harder to subvert. However, for the host-based intrusion detection systems, you get direct access to the semantics of the activity, so you really understand what the web server is about to do. The different kinds of obfuscations have no effect in that regard. You can protect against non-network threats as well. Um, that is malicious software that might be running if you're looking at what the host machine is about to do. So attacks that didn't come over the network but are coming from someone at the computer, for example. You get visibility into encrypted activity. So if you're encrypting the network traffic, you don't need to do active man in the middles in order to know exactly what was being said. And the performance scales along with the machines. So you, if you have a lot more network traffic, you may need to start installing more network intrusion detection systems. Whereas if you're running it on the host, it simply runs alongside the code. So now let's think about how we could actually detect this sort of deviant behavior or malicious behavior. Basically, how do we generalize this concept that we have sort of used as our example of reading the password file, reading slash Etsy slash password, how do we generalize this into the concept of just bad activity in general? Like, so that an intrusion detection system doesn't just look for attempts to read the password file, but actually just attempts to do weird, strange, unexpected, unusual, and possibly malicious behavior. So there, we have a number of different approaches. The first is to use signature-based detection. So a signature-based detection looks for activity that matches a known attack. Basically, we've seen these attacks before, and now someone else is doing them, right? And this is a typical of certain t attacker types. So the, the example of a, a script kitty uh, attacker who is just executing some program that they've been given to do an attack would be able to be thwarted by signature-based detection. Because we've seen the attack, we know what it looks like, we know what to look for, and we can see it when, and we can recognize it when it's happening. Right, so it's a simple approach, but it's blind to anything new. So if there's a new attack that we've never seen before, it will automatically evade signature-based detection because it's strict exa exactly because it's an, a novel attack. It's not on our list of things to look for. It's not on our com list of complete attacks that we know about. And signature-based detection typically considers just the syntax and not the semantics. So it's not trying to understand what the attacker is actually doing. It's just looking at the shape of the packets and detecting whether uh, it fits an attack shape or not in that sense. So it's a, a simple um, way of defeating some adversaries, but not a, as an effective way of defeating uh, most adversaries because it can't find new novel attacks. Another type of detection is known as anomaly-based detection. Here, we build a model of normal usage. So for instance, a model might be that we call add item some number of times, uh, and then maybe we call allow remove item and add item and something like that. So we have these functions get called, and then we call the shopping cart function, and then we call the pay function. So we build this model of how a user would interact with a network service, how they would interact with a web service. They, this is the standard route. And it would be very unusual to call pay before going to the shopping cart or to call pay before adding items or something like that. So now any activity that deviates from the model that we build, which we can model as, for example, a state machine of how the system, how, which functions can be called in different states of the system. If we are deviating from this model, we can implicitly flag it as suspicious activities. That's how we can detect an anomaly and then maybe use a machine learning technology type thing to look at all the log data and build uh, an automatic anomaly detection system based on actual user data. So 
build what is the correct usage of a system, not based on figuring it out by using it, but based on how thousands of people have used it and what they actually did under the assumption that that this was all legitimate non-attack traffic. And then if something is outside, this would be implicitly an anomaly and would um, therefore get flagged. Now, on the downside, if you don't have many attack examples, you will have false positives. So you can't use machine learning to build a, uh, an, a exa- to use it as examples of anomaly, typically because attack traffic will be much rarer than legitimate traffic. You could have specification-based detection. So here, instead of trying to learn what is normal, and instead of learning what would be normal usage of a system, you actually simply specify it. And here, you could specify all the rules for all of the input and exactly what is allowed. So all URL parameters have at most one slash. Right now, slash Etsy slash password would be denied by this policy, for example. And this can detect novel attacks because if a novel attack is outside of the specification, the specification will observe that this is not uh, what is allowed to be uh, processed by this web server. So it has very low false positives precisely because it's designed to exactly match what is allowed to be processed. So the false positives cannot really exist because the system simply describes what is allowed and hopefully matches, right? Where there is a discrepancy, there would be an opportunity for false positives, but hopefully the specification actually matches reality and that is thereby inhibited. The problem, of course, is this is quite expensive. It requires actual human labor to update this or create the specifications in the first place and requires labor to update them whenever anything changes, right? So it is a time consuming, uh, labor intensive operation to actually provide correct specifications for any network service that you might be running. Another example is of a detection mechanism is behavior-based detection. So here, instead of looking for attacks, you're actually looking for evidence of compromised of a system. So instead of, for instance, looking at attempts to read the password file, you look for the password file going out. You look for data from the password file leaving your networks. Or you look for things that an attacker might do if they log into your system, if they gain shell access to your system. For instance, they might stop recording log lines that, or, or stop logging information about what they're typing, remove their history file, for example, or disable the collection of history. They may, uh, you might see system calls that the compiled programs on your system never call. So all of your programs that you're running, you look at all their system calls. If suddenly you see system calls that are being made that are not actually part of the core program, that the, the compiled program wasn't set up to call, is evidence that they've somehow created a shell and now are, are doing arbitrary execution in your system. Or you might say, these system calls are allowed, but they're always occurring in this order, and now they're occurring in a different order, and that order itself is is evidence of a compromise. So the idea here is that instead of actually trying to stop the attack, we're trying to recognize things attackers do after an attack has succeeded. And the final form of detection is known as honeypots. So a honeypot is a sacrificial system that has no operational purpose. That is, it's a computer running on your system that no one has any business logging into, that no one has any reason to try to connect to, that no one has any reason to uh, request any information from or try to log into or anything like that. So with the use of a honeypot, it implies that an attacker has done a network scan trying to find this machine somehow, is able to figure out that that machine exists, that it's running services, it tries to connect onto those services. Any access to a honeypot is by definition not authorized because the honeypot is not to be used by any legitimate entity in the world. So it is immediately suspicious and obvious in in this case that if an attacker logs into a honeypot, they have done it by means of some uh, attack or they have some uh, malicious intent in mind. So honeypots are useful because they can identify and track 
the intruders into your system, study what they're up to, look at what they actually try to do, look at the uh, sequence of executions that they do to try to understand how they interact with your system and what they will do if they do log in. It can be useful because it diverts them from legitimate targets if they waste their time and resources attacking fake systems that have no real that pose no real threat that don't store any sensitive information that can't do anything malicious on your actual network then they waste their times attacking these systems instead of your legitimate ones although it can be hard to lure the attacker and it also is a significant amount of work to make the environment convincing if you just have a honeypot that can't do anything that can't access any web pages when you try to do it that doesn't save files when you write files it will be obviously suspicious that it is a honeypot. So the attackers know honeypots exist as well. They know there's a non-trivial chance that if they log into a system, it may be a honeypot, especially if it happens to be very easy to log into, for example. And so it can take a lot of work to actually make a honeypot convincing to an attacker. 